uh, this is my first Endgame X clam class that I'm going to be teaching. So uh, we'll see how it goes. We're, I have three examples prepared for you guys. Uh, they're quite difficult, most of them. So I'm going to uh, give you some time to try to solve them. Um, once again, they're not going to be easy. Uh, they're played by very, very powerful players. Uh, the first example is a game between Fisher and uh, Petrosian uh, from uh, way back. And this is the position. I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about what you have to do. White to move. White to move. Um, I think we're going to be white in all three examples if we manage to go through all three. Um, but yeah, in this position, white to move, try to um, create a plan, understand what you need to do in the position, and uh, avoid all counterplay. This is going to be the theme of the day, trying to avoid our opponent's counterplay, because that's uh, a crucial part of building your technique in the end game, is not allowing your opponent to get what he wants, especially when you have the advantage. Because it's very, very easy to spoil uh, end game advantages if you're not paying attention to your opponent's ideas. So uh, this is the position. Obviously, white is better for countless reasons. One of them is that he has the majority on the queen side. Uh, black has a uh, pass pawn, but right now he cannot really make use of it. It's quite a weak pawn more or less a liability in the position at the moment. And uh, white's pieces are simply just uh, much more active. The bishop on d3 is attacking this pawn on a6, which is uh, probably the most important weakness in black's position, as, as we will see later on. Uh, the problem is, how are we going to try to take advantage of it? So give it some thought. Maybe bounce some ideas off, off me if you have. Take yes? Bishop to f5, okay, this is an interesting move. I s um, but again, we were discussing the a6 uh, pawn is the weakness, right? Oh, so okay. why would we take one of the attackers of that a6 pawn and exchange one of his, I mean, one of his pieces that, that is quite um, passive at the moment. It's not really doing anything. The bishop on e6, I would say, is a bad piece for black. Hitting, hitting the pawn on d5, uh, our bishop on d3 is actually very, very powerful. It's one of our best pieces in the position. Uh, opened up, it controls both sides of the board. So I don't really see why we should do this. I can play something like king f8 maybe. Defending my rook. I mean, if you take on e6, then um, I'm probably going to take back with the rook. And slowly, slowly, we're, we're liquidating the pieces. And that and can only help black, right? Exactly, exactly. No, the white bishop, to be honest, is once again one of the best pieces uh, of white. So I think bishop f5 doesn't necessarily accomplish much. So knight to c5? Knight to c5 is an option. So we do have, um, we do have candidate moves. Uh, bishop f5 I think we can eliminate quite quickly. Knight c5 for sure is one of the candidate moves. But let's try to... Uh, add some more options to the table. And if we cannot find anything but knight c5, then we're going to go with that one. Thank you. Rook a to c1, absolutely, to uh, grab the empty uh, file. But we can do that later. We can do that later. He's not really threatening to take that file. I mean, maybe rook c7. But uh, I think we can uh, work against that quite, quite easily. Any other candidates? Knight to b6. Knight to b6, of course, attacking, uh, attacking the rook. The problem with knight b6, I think I will just simply play rook b8, and then, yeah, exactly. then you're, yeah. you're actually in trouble. Well, not in trouble, because you can go back, but you're losing some, uh, some important tempos. Yeah. Very good. Uh, exactly. That's, uh, that's probably the best move in the position. B4. Um, once again, the theme of today's lessons is do not hurry and uh, do not allow your opponent any sort of counterplay. So knight c5, the problem with knight c5 is that I'm simply going to play a5. I'm going to get rid of that uh, weakness. And then it's going to be much more difficult to create a passed pawn. 
If we play b4 on the other hand first, which is um, the move Fischer played, whenever he plays a5 right now, we have what move? We have b5, yeah. And that's going to be a passed pawn, but more importantly, potentially, a protected passed pawn. Because then this pawn from a2 is going to go to a4, defending the pawn on b5. And if you put a pawn on a5, that will become most probably a liability, a weakness. Because we can transfer the knight, knight c5, knight b3. Let's say the pawn is on a4, the pawn is on b5. And then the pawn on a5 is going to be a huge weakness. Right? So um, on the defending side, generally you're trying to exchange pawns as many as possible, right? Simplify the position as much as possible. Um, that's why b4, avoiding that is, is, is very, very good. It's a good move. All right, b4, king f8, knight to c5. And uh, as we can see, if he goes uh, a5, we're going to go b5, and uh, the position is slowly, slowly becoming hopeless, almost. Again, I'm going to go a4, knight b3, then I'm going to put my rook on c on the c file, and uh, slowly, slowly, you're going to run out of moves. Also, at the right moment, I'm going to play b6, b7, and potentially put my, uh, my uh, pawn on the seventh rank, then defend it, knight a6. Plenty, plenty of ideas to convert my advantage, right? Um, much better than if uh, the, a, the pawns on the a file would be exchanged. So he played the move bishop to c8. f3, very powerful move. Why is that? Keeps the knight out, keeps the knight out from, uh, uh, e f from e4. Also prepares the uh, coming of the king in the center. King f2, king e3, king d4. If I manage to bring my king to d4, the position is going to be extremely, extremely difficult. Rook a7. Rook e5. What are we preventing with this move? Once again, we're talking about prevention. Let's go back one move. What was Black's main idea? Pushing that pawn behind each other's rooks. Again, if you push a5, I'm going to go b5. Always. You could have pushed a5 before also. Uh, putting the rook on a7 doesn't necessarily uh, aid in that plan. a5 is always going to be met with b5, and um, that's going to be all she wrote. Mm -hmm. That's definitely enough to win. If I manage to create the pass pawn, then it's going to be very difficult to uh, defend. It's already very difficult to defend. Absolutely. Um, black threat in the position was knight to d7. Simple as that. Uh, trying to exchange one of his powerful, uh, one of white's most powerful pieces, the knight on c5. Exchange some pieces. And um, rook e5 plays exactly against that because the knight is going to be immobile. So rook e5 was played. Bishop to d7. All right. And this is one of the critical moments in the game. Let's try to um, understand the position and um, once again come up with a set of candidate moves. A4. A4 is one of them, sure. To keep the bishop out from the To keep the bishop out from b5, right? I think actually, yeah, as, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Ken West is mentioning, bishop b5 is a threat, exchanging some pieces you definitely don't want to play after bishop b5. Bishop takes b5 because that would um, basically open up the a file and um, allow black's rooks to get active, which is definitely not something that we would like as white. Anything else besides a4, which is a very sensible, sensible move? I remember now that the pieces always remain tight. Ah, OK. Yes, a classic. This is a classic. So, um, bringing the king to the center. Yeah, that's uh, that. That's another sensible uh, idea.
I can tell you that the move that uh, was played in the game is actually not something that the engines like initially. But as you go as you go along with uh, with the variation with the game, they start to understand the position a little bit better and give credit to uh, to wise decision. Yeah, Brooklyn A1 uh, absolutely at 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 some point is going to be. Uh, carefully improved by white. But also, let's ask ourselves, <coughs> besides bishop b5, so let's go, let's say we go a4, yeah? What would black do in the position? To try to create some sort of counterplay or try to make use of, of his plan. What is his plan? Hmm? Yes, bishop d7 was his last move. So he played bishop d7. Let's say you're going to play a4 to avoid bishop b5. But now, maybe he has an extra option. Rook to b8? Let's see. A rook to b8, knight takes a6. I think. And the pawn on b4 is protected, the knight on a6, then I go b5, this is game over, right? So rook b8 is now working. His position is more or less paralyzed. But he does have one little option of uh, trying to avoid his final fate. d4, let's see. <coughs> D4. Um, I'm going to try to uh, to just simply improve my position and potentially target that uh, pawn. So I'm the consequence of you playing D4 is that now the C4 square is available for my rook. So I think I'm going to go rook C1, rook C4, yeah. and then um, oops, the D4 pawn is going to yeah. be lost it seems. So d4, uh, whenever you're advancing that, uh, that, that free pawn on, on the d file, you have to be very careful because it's no longer going to be protected. And it's going to become a clear target. I have bishop c6. With the idea? Protecting the pawn. Bishop c6 with the idea, okay, yes, protecting the pawn, but most importantly. Most importantly, um, knight d7. Knight d7. Voila, yeah. Uh, Bishop c6 and knight d7, um, and trying to exchange the knight. Yeah? Um, if we manage to do that, we might have some chances of survival. Of course, it's not going to be trivial, still, white is um, way on top, but definitely is going to become slowly, slowly a little bit easier for black to deal with his problems. Uh, for example, if after, let's say, bishop c6, we go rook c1, I think after knight d7, okay, we take, take, and the problem is that we cannot take on d5 right now because bishop takes a4. That pawn is hanging right now. Um, if you don't play rook c1 and maintain control over the a4 pawn, then after knight d7, knight takes d7, I'm going to take with the rook because my bishop on c6 is not going to be attacked. So um, I have options, yeah? So in this, in this position, instead of a4, maybe something, uh, something else. Arjun, yes. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, that's definitely a candidate move. But can you explain a little bit why you would give your strong knight from c5 for his passive, let's say, bishop on d7? Well, because the king today is uh, preventing counterplay. Mm -hmm. it, counter it does prevent a lot of counterplay. And then um, after that, we're going to have the, the end game of two rooks and bishop versus two rooks and knight. Which uh, cooperation is better? Uh, Between the bishop and the rook, or the rook and the knight? Uh, I think the knight, actually. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Rook and bishop is, well, of course, there's always exceptions. But um, 
yeah, rook and bishop is generally considered to be stronger than the, 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 the rook and the knight, especially with pawns on both sides of the board, uh, especially with asymmetrical structures. Um, knight and queen is usually better than knight and bishop. Um, because, yeah, the rook and the, and, and the bishop uh, complement each other very, very well. The queen and the knight complement each other very, we very well. So, uh, yes, knight takes d7 is not looking very good at, uh, at, at first glance because you're giving such a strong piece from c5. The problem is um, you're going to get a very, very nice advantage afterwards. Rook takes d7. Continue. Absolutely. Natural play is usually the best course of action. And that is rook to c1. rook c1, of course. Rook to c1 is the move. Uh, you're also threatening once the same problems uh, are still there for black. Whenever he goes a5, we go b5, we pass, and then we have a pass pawn. Protected, potentially protected pass pawn because once again, a4, we protect that pawn and we don't even have to hurry. And um, Another trump of, of exchanging immediately is that we once again take control over the c5. And we're attack we're preparing what move? Right now? Yeah. yeah. We're threatening, let's say, what move? C6, Rook c6, exactly. We're threatening uh, the penetration on the sixth rank, and that would be almost game over. So rook d6 had to be played. Rook c7, knight to d7. Rook e2, g6. Is he threatening anything? No, he's not threatening anything. <laughs> so what do we do when our opponent doesn't necessarily have any threats? Do we hurry or do we just s slowly improve our position? Slowly improve our position. So what is something that could improve our position at this moment? Yes. A4, A4 is, uh, is one way. Yeah. Anything else? A4 can wait, right? Also. Um, there's something more important. Double the rooks. Double the rooks can, can wait as well. Let's bring the king. Let's bring the king to the center. If we manage to get, I mean, if we manage to get the king to d4, the game is just simply over. Um, we're going to uh, attack the other weakness, the pawn on d5 with the king on d4. King ready to jump uh, in play whenever we exchange potentially the rooks. So um, if we manage to get the king to d4, it's just going to be all she wrote. So king f2 was what Fischer played. h5. Uh, yes, we probably could have played king e3. He chose to uh, completely eliminate any, any sort of counterplay. He played the move f4 to take away the e5 square. So if king e3, maybe knight e5 would have came on the board. And then uh, the bishop doesn't really have where to go. Uh, because if you go to c2, then I just simply go knight c4, and then I, I, I'm starting to get some, some sort of yeah. counterplay. You, you, you feel like you're, you're, at least one of your pieces is getting a little bit more active, yeah? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's whenever one of my pieces gets active in a completely hopeless position, it feels so good, you know? It feels so good. You, you know you're losing, most probably, ev even so, but... Uh, you feel so good to just have some sort of play and, and not feel like you're just waiting to be slaughtered. So you should try to maintain that feeling uh, for your opponent. So he played f4. h4. Knight to d4. Absolutely, you can. Or you can provoke another weakness. was the consequence of the move h4. Go along the line. It weakens the pawn on, eight, on h4. Yeah. So we can play what move first? 
King F3, exactly. Which forces? F5, exactly. And now? This is another weakness, obviously, right? The seventh rank has, uh, has become a little bit more uh, weaker. Uh, you no longer have the option of potentially playing f6 and controlling the e5 square. So that's a problem as well. Um, your pawns are on light squares. That could become a problem as well. You're, f you're, you're full of problems. So king e3, just continue, continue the normal, natural play. d4, king d2. What is now uh, White's plan? Easy, very easy plan, actually. To paralyze his position even more. Bring in a bishop into space. How? Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bring the bishop to c4. Um, the knight cannot move because rook f7 will come on the board and then some nasty discovery attacks. Um, and then king goes to d3, keeping control over d4 square. And that's going to be very, very quickly game over. Okay, you're, 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 you're going to run out of moves, basically. So he played the move knight to b6. Rook e7. This doesn't look very it's good. This, do <laughs> this doesn't look very good. Uh, knight d5. Okay. Go long. Rook f7. King e8. Rook to b7. Knight takes b4. Hmm? He played the move bishop c4, and uh, actually the game ended here because of uh, knight c6. What? What could I do? Let's find. Tell me the whole variation. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Correct. Very good. Correct. Oh, man. Game over, right? Nice. Um, and he just played b4 at the beginning. After that, he hasn't moved his, uh, his pawns on the queen side. He, he played everything, um, and he improved his, his whole position through his pieces, uh, through the, the maneuvers of the king, king f3, weakening the seventh rank, and so on. He just slowly, slowly forced his opponent to make one more weakness, every single move, one more weakness, and so on. Yeah? So quite an instructive end game. Uh, Fisher versus Petrosian from uh, Buenos Aires, yeah. as uh, you mentioned. Uh, I think it was a candidate, candidate, match. candidate match in 1971. Uh, Fisher versus Petrosian. This one, I would say, is a little bit more difficult. Let's take some time, because uh, there's some maneuvering going on. And we have to understand it. This is a game, um, I think Botvinnik is a pretty strong, and uh, versus Levenfish, who was also a strong Grandmaster in 1937. Very old games. I will pick more modern games for next time. All games are good. All games are good, of course, of course, especially if they're instructive. Yeah. So this is it. Let's try to understand the position. Uh, material is equal. You do have double pawns on the A file. Um, you do have a potentially weak pawn on e5. But you have a very nice uh, idea available. If you wouldn't have it, then black would be perfectly fine. Let's try to find that idea. And we're going to find it by asking ourselves, what does black want to do? Which is quite easy. He wants to push the c pawn. 
the antidote is uh he cannot push the c pawn no that that knight is a great uh blocker yeah yeah blockading piece absolutely uh, i mean black is just trying to activate his his king yeah if he manages to get to e6 force the rook out of the way then somehow put his uh, knight bring his knight into play maybe something like i don't know knight c7 knight e6 or knight c7 um knight b5 and so on if white doesn't do anything you're you're the one who's going to have weaknesses one weakness on e5 um the two uh the two pawns on the a file double pawns and then if the knight moves from c4 you're going to have problems defending against the expansion uh of the c pawn the advancement of the c pawn <laughs> I see you, Arjun. I see you. <laughs> and now we know the plan. Yeah? We know Black's plan. So we have to eliminate that, the counterplay. If you go rook, rook d8, I'm going to go king e7. King e7, right? Right. Yeah. So he just king e7. Actually yeah, I mean, you go, you can go something like maybe rook a8, but then I go knight c7 i think yeah. and then i mean if you get your rook on a7 despite the fact that it attacks the pawn on a6 uh that one that weakness is clearly defended and uh right now i have king d5 coming i think you're actually in trouble yeah. um King's coming to the center now. exactly exactly so the rook is not really doing anything there mm -hmm. unfortunately <laughs> let's try to calculate of course that that's the first instinct yeah rook d7 should be the first instinct because um it just blocks him from coming to uh, e7 what is black going to do after rook d7 rook d7 knight g7 yeah. and then i mean i'm going to start bringing my king out king f2 Rook a7. And then play knight e7. And then, like, try to make defense and 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 defense Maybe you can try to play knight to e6 first. Then knight c7, I think. So knight e6. Mm -hmm. Wait, rook d7 was a bit hasty, I think. Rook a7, sorry, was a bit hasty. What if I go knight d6 directly here? Hmm? You're losing f7. Um, so I think you do have some counterplay, of course, after c4. There should be some sort of counterplay. I'm not sure if it's enough because I'm uh, forcing your king uh, back to g8 and now I'm going to have a lot of mating ideas, mating, mating threats. So I can just simply play some like maybe rook b7. Right. Rook b7, I don't think you can push the pawn because of rook b8. Now you're forced to go here. Actually, you can still do that. And now... Hmm? It's a good question. I have ways to stop the pawn. I'm, not, I, I'm just not sure if it's enough. So let's say I go, I take here. Then I check you again. And then I have rook f7 and then rook f1. But I'm not sure that's not. I want something more than that. Yeah, I, I don't think I have something more. So I, I, I'm probably going to have to play rook f7, which is not enough. Let's try to find something better. 
That's an interesting um, plan. Knight to g7. Let's start from here. Knight d6 feels right. It just feels like the right move. c4, rook f7, king g8. I can, I can. That's uh, that's probably the better alternative, just to go rook f2. Yeah, because that pawn is running really fast. That pawn is running really, really fast. And now I, I think I'm going to be able to block the pawn. If you go c3, rook, uh, rook c2, and then I'm going to bring my knight back, knight to e4, I'm going to take the pawn on c3, and most probably I'm going to end up one pawn up. Yeah. Something like that. Knight e6, knight, ah, knight d4. Ah. Wait, can't you That's the problem. Very tricky, very tricky. End games are extremely, extremely tricky. Let's see. He's threatening to play rook takes e6. Absolutely. Only if I have the king on f2 already. Only, only if I go king f2, rook d6, then I think rook g7 should be OK, because I catch your pawn, right? So, but the problem is after king f2, I just simply go c3. And you no longer catch that pawn. We found the refutation, guys. Hmm. Maybe. <laughs> um, correct. Okay, correct. Maybe that was a bit too hasty. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Maybe just bring the king, huh? No. Let's try to bring the king. Even though I really wanted to make that work. But, yeah, it's probably too much. So now, Arjun? Knight f5 or knight d6? Okay, let's go with knight f5 first. Knight f5, you're stopping knight d6. Um... I'm just going to bring my king. Actually, now that you went uh, you went this way, I can go rook a7 and not worry about you bringing knight e6, knight c7. Hmm? Yeah, I think knight f5 is just not the best route for the knight. I think maybe knight e6. Because anyway, you kind of want to go to d4 maybe, yeah? That's kind of the big square for you. Uh, but also, with, with the knight on e6, you have the option of jumping to c7. A bit more defensive, but you want to evict this rook from the 7th rank, yeah? yeah? If you can. Wait, but you're not really threatening knight c7 right now. Because I, w I will have knight d6 then. Yeah. Do I have knight d6 now? My king is a bit closer. That's the difference. My king is a bit closer. Do you want to play c4 here? Yeah. All right. So let's go like this. Ah, and now you're still threatening. But now, okay, maybe I, I will go like this. I will allow you to push your pawn all the way to the... No, but that's bad. Yeah. And this is just game over. Uh, this is just game over. Knight b3 is coming. So knight d6 is uh, really, really dangerous. I should keep the, my knight there. Okay. Continue.
Yeah, it shouldn't complicate with 96. Simple play should be should be enough. King e8. Let's go here. Knight c7 now. Knight c7. I had a crazy idea, but it's not working. What I was thinking was rook b6. King d7. I think it's the only move. If you take, I take with the pawn. And then uh, my pawn is just way too fast. And now I want to play e6. And then if you take with anything but the rook, I have knight e5 check. But unfortunately, you would take with the rook, and uh, that's a check. If I would have the king on d3, that would work. So, ah. No, OK, let's go king e3. Let's continue with king e3. King e8, rook b7. Knight c7, and now I'm just going to play normal, normal move. Or I have an even better idea. King here. I actually want to bring my king to uh, c4. If I would have another move, I would play knight d6, king moves somewhere, and then I'm playing king c4. And I want to block that c pawn with the king. Probably. Probably the best move. Well, knight b6 does work, I think. Let's try knight b6, king here. And now I want to go here, king c4. Yeah, and king doesn't work in the one that I was thinking. I think if king e5, I might have check. This should be winning for me, I think. I think you still have some way. Ah, no, you don't. Um, actually, you do have knight e8, I think. Knight e8, and if you take knight d6. Oh, yeah. <laughs> rook f7, rook f6. So in this position, if you, if you don't take the rook you take here, I think I have rook f6. But even this should be winning for. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is completely winning for white. My pawn is way too fast. Yeah. I play knight c7 next, the pawn rolls. So I think, I think this is the plan, just bringing the king to c4. Slowly, slowly, not allowing, uh, obviously not allowing now king c8. That would uh, force our rook off the seventh rank, and then just uh, knight b6, king c4. And most of his pieces are more or less paralyzed right now. That a6 pawn is, is going to be a weakness. So knight g7, I think, would have been a good try, nonetheless. But what to do after rook c7? Like as, white? Like as black. After rook d7, rook c7. Yes, that should be the main question. That's the first thing we should calculate because it's just the most uh, forced variation. Rook c7 trying to get uh, the rook off the 7 rank and trying to accomplish his plan along the way of, of bringing the king to the center as soon as possible. So what to do now? Knight b6, uh, it's an interesting move. C4, rook takes c7, and then knight takes c4. But even then, uh, my king is very close, and, and the knight on c7 is quite powerful because it defends the a6 pawn. Um, so let's see. Knight b6. No, I don't want to take. OK, c4, let's go. Let's see, like, let, let's see this variation. Because I have a feel. I have. A, whoa, what is this? All right, <laughs> correct. Now king e7. The king might be a bit too slow, yeah? And despite the fact you're a pawn up, um, 
I think this should be okay for black. I think he has more than enough counterplay, yeah? Because yeah. you cannot really get to the a6 pawn very easily. So I can play something like knight b5, maybe. And then uh, knight d4, knight c6, reroute my knight, uh, take this pawn or this pawn. And uh, actually, I think black shouldn't have any problems here. We got the pawn, but it's not enough. He exchanged the rooks. He got his king into play. Let's try to keep him passive. It's important to keep him passive. White found a very nice maneuver. Play the move rook d8, king to e7. And now rook d6. Because e takes, uh, e takes d6 after knight takes d6 is a fork, right? So it all started from the beginning. He forced the rook to go to c7 so that it's on, uh, it, it's on the danger square. Rook c7, rook d8. You're forced to play king e7 because knight d6 is a threat. And now after rook d6, your rook becomes passive. Your rook has to go on the a7 uh, square and... Uh, my position is going to be dominant. So rook to a7. If you try to go rook d7 for active play, you're probably not going to succeed because uh, the knight goes to support the, to support the pawn, the a pawn. Let's say uh, c4, rook a8, rook c8. And uh, slowly, slowly, we're going to take all the pawns and uh, simply have a winning position. Yeah. I think it's two pawns up. This should be definitely winning. With slow play, of course, it's going to take uh, a little bit of uh, technique to convert it. But still, that should be winning. You're not getting enough counterplay with that pawn. So he decided to go for passive defense, rook to a7. What to do now? Where do we go with the rook? We have to we have to stay on the sixth rank. Rook c six or rook b six? Rook c six, absolutely. But the question is why? What if he goes? Uh, what would be the difference if you go rook to b six? Sure, but you you don't necessarily want to take that c pawn to be honest. Imagine this. Okay, you go rook c six. Rook takes c5, yeah? You make two moves in a row, somehow. I go rook c7. I force the rook exchange. I'm fine with you being a pawn up. Your pawn up is, is, is a double pawn on the a file. But my king is closer to the center, right? So what, what you actually want to do, your plan, is to bring the king first. King f2, king e3, king e4, and then you can do whatever you want. Then you can start collecting pawns. But what you want to do is... Uh, dominate black yeah do not allow him any counterplay even even if that comes at the cost of not taking material yeah do not hurry with taking material um it's a different problem actually uh the the, the move rook b6 allows the move f6 and that creates once again some sort of imbalance in the position some sort of counterplay rook c6 doesn't because rook c6 now if you go f6 i take and then i take on c5 and then you don't have the move rook c7 and i'm just going to be a pawn up um, after king d7 now rook to b6 i'm not going to take your c5 pawn and now f6 is not a possibility anymore right king e7 he went back and now we gain a, a tempo. At least we gain a tempo. King to f2, f6, was played. King to e2. Rook to a8. Rook to c6. Now we're going to the c5 pawn because he doesn't have rook c7. And our king is very close to the center. f takes c5, rook takes c5. Knight to d6. What to do? 
Rook takes pawn check, uh, king f6. Mm -hmm. But then I'm not so sure how this position is. Do I have to wait? Oops, no, not there. Um, yeah, this might be enough as well. Oh, wait. Can I go rook c8? No. I was trying to play something like uh, rook e8 and then rook e5. The problem is you have rook, e s rook c6. It's kind of annoying. Um, so this might be winning as well. This might might be winning as well. Uh, he chose a different different path, and that was uh, rook to c7. King e6. Knight takes d6. King takes d6. Rook takes h7. Basically, you're going to be able to create a pass pawn far away. Yeah. Um, the e5 pawn doesn't matter that much. What matters the most is that you're going to be able to uh, have a pass pawn very, very far away from the center of the action on the h file. The second weakness. The second weakness, exactly. Exactly. And once again, his pawn in the center is not that valuable. It's very well controlled by the king. Yeah? Um, technical win. Rook to b8. Rook, b, uh, rook g7. Rook to b2. King to f1, king to f3 running into e4, I think. Then you have some problems. So no counterplay whatsoever. Rook takes g6, king to e5. Let's grab another pawn, absolutely. Greediness is good, sometimes. Um, king to f4, a6, rook to a1, king to a e2, rook a2, king d1, rook takes a3, and now? H4. H4, absolutely. The king is uh, blocked on the e file, yeah, because if he goes on the f file, you go rook f8, promote, and so on. Uh, rook d3, rook d7. <laughs> Which one? He pushed the G-pawn. Oh, okay. Just protected The point is, whenever you go rook, uh, whenever you go king e2, I'm going to do what? Most probably rook e8. Going to force the exchange of the a-pawn with the e-pawn. That's eliminating all the counterplay you have in the position. Game over. Yeah? And the king is cut. Like, for example, if you go king here, um, the king is cut on the third rank. So rook here is forced, Let's say here. And now if I, uh, if I go king g3, wh what is uh, white going to do? G5. Of course, g5 and not h5. h5 would probably be a huge mistake because after king h4, this might actually, this is a draw. King goes to g5, and I think with the, uh, with a king in between your pawns, this is impossible to win. But g5 just wins on the spot. Yeah. So let's go back to the game because there were some more moves. Instead of king e2, he played ki rook d7, king c5, and he resigned. So yeah, um, that's big part of, of improving your technique. And that is not hurrying and always trying to spot any single gram of, of counterplay of your opponents and, uh, and annihilate that. Try to stop it at all costs.